Thank you for joining. We're continuing our study of Satan, talking about, in a very practical way, the tools that Satan has at his disposal in order to accomplish his goal of separating us from God. And we talked last time about uh, probably the thing we think of mo more than anything else, which is temptation, and how Satan takes advantage of our own appetites and tries to draw our attention to things that God has prohibited uh, in order to get us into a position of sin so that we would die spiritually and be separated from God. Um, and we uh, not only talked about the ways that he tries to do that, but the ways that we can uh, resist and defeat Satan's efforts. This time, we're going to talk about another one of Satan's tools, and that's one that maybe doesn't get as much attention, but it deserves it, because false teaching will separate us from God, um, maybe more subtly, but just as, as well as sin and temptation. And so false teaching is one of the things that's in Satan's toolbox. Now, uh, last time, we looked at one specific example, one scene where Satan tempted Eve, and we learned a lot from that encounter. This time, I'd like to do the same thing by looking at one encounter, uh, but Satan versus Jesus, which is found in Matthew chapter 4 and verses 1 through 11. So I invite you to have a Bible as we read along this passage and then make some comments about it. Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's a quotation from Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3. Then the devil took Jesus into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. And notice those words are in Satan's mouth. It is written. This is a quotation from Psalm 91. He will command his angels concerning you, <clears throat> and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall put the Lord your God to the test. I'm sorry, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Quotation from Deuteronomy 6 and verse 13. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. So some important facts that we learn from this passage is that Satan has memorized the Bible. Um, Satan is perhaps a better Bible student than any of us human beings are. He knows it backwards and forwards. He can quote it just as effectively as any gospel preacher. But what he does with that is not quoted in such a way to bring us to the truth, but misquotes it or uses it out of context in order to try to convince us to understand it the wrong way and to get ourselves into troubling situations. We need to realize that, uh, let me put this next slide up, that Satan hates the truth. He knows the truth. He knows it very, very well but he absolutely hates it. We know, uh, Satan knows and appreciates, perhaps better than we do, the power of the truth, which is to bring people to a knowledge of God and salvation through the gospel message. So, of course, he doesn't want that message getting out there any more than, than necessary. If you look at Luke chapter 8 and this great parable of the soils, Luke chapter 8 and verses 11 through 12, I'm just going to read the, the part of this that uh, matters for our purposes, that the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard. The devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. So what's going on there? You may remember the, the farmer goes out and sows his seed. He just sort of uh, 
broadcasts that seed over the ground that's in front of him. And some of that seed inevitably lands on the hard packed soil, the pavement that is on the road or beside the road. Well, that's an easy target for the birds. And Jesus says in this parable, what that means is that Satan comes and snatches the word of God before it has an opportunity to germinate and penetrate into the mind and the heart of the people. Satan hates the truth. And anytime he gets an opportunity, he's going to prevent that truth from taking root in a person's life where it can actually do them some good. You can see also in 2 Corinthians 4 that uh, Paul says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan's going to do the best he can to keep God's word from penetrating our hearts and doing what it is intended to do there, which is to change our hearts and to bring us closer to God. And so Satan, in a very real sense, is the source of false teaching. Now, I realize that Satan uses various medium in order to get his uh, false teaching spread around. But, uh, but it really comes from him in a real sense of the word. James 3, verses 13 through 18. James 3, 13 through 18, talks about the bitter jealousy and selfish ambition that's in the heart of some people. Uh, those who are arrogant and lie against the truth. But, but look at this in verse 15. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural demonic. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. So there is a kind of wisdom which is a demonic wisdom. And I suppose that that could have a great range of meanings, but at least one of the things to appreciate is that not all wisdom is pure, and anything that doesn't come from God's wisdom or from his revealed word um, has a different source. It may just be the wisdom of this earth. It may be the wisdom, quote unquote, wisdom of Satan himself, who is spreading it in order to take advantage of people. Again, you see this in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 1 through 3. 1 Timothy 4 and verses 1 through 3, that the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, which I would suggest we're living in, some will fall away from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. By means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Now, it's actually interesting as a side note here that the demonic doctrines that he's talking about are actually too restrictive. Um, we might expect him to talk about uh, licentious doctrines. Oh, you, you do whatever you want to, whatever makes you happy. God is cool with. Uh, that's normally what we think of when we think of demonic false teaching. But anything that's untrue is demonic. And Satan can use teaching that is too harsh um, in order to spread his ways also. Um, but in any case, regardless of the nature of the teaching, notice that in verse 1, it's the doctrines of demons. False teaching are, are demonic doctrines. And notice in verse 2 that it comes to us by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience. Satan doesn't show up in person at church. Satan infects various teachers with the untruth of his ways and has them do the dirty work of, of teaching uh, on his behalf. Remember that Satan can disguise his teachings in order to look good uh, 2 Corinthians talks about him uh, disguising himself as an angel of light and a uh, messenger of, of good things, that his followers do the same thing. Um, and again, an example in Acts chapter 13, where Satan uses people in order to spread false teaching. So again, to bring this all together and summarize a little bit, remember that Satan will, um, will use God's word in a, a wrong way in order to spread false teaching. Um, one more thought before we get to the practical ideas of how to resist. <clears throat> Realize that Satan can sometimes even use false wonders 
in order to support his false teaching. This is something that becomes very tricky because if, if we're not careful, we might hear a new or different teaching and say, but uh, the guy who told it to me was able to perform miracles. Um, that, that's something that we're often told to look at as proof of the truth of a person's statements, but it's not always the case. Um, and so that's why we have to be very sophisticated and very savvy and, and understand that even a miracle, um, which, which by the way, is very difficult to contradict somebody's senses, what they say they saw or heard, um, that's almost in a way beside the point. Whether or not somebody has witnessed a miracle or what they believe to be a miracle, God's word will never contradict his written word. And so the issue really becomes, is it something that we find in Scripture or not? That, that's the main question, the heart of the question. <clears throat> so 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 8 through 12 reminds us that a lawless one will be revealed. Um, and you'll notice that his coming in verse 9 is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. So again, we've gotta be really sophisticated and, and do what we see in 1 John 4 verses one through six, where John says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from, the, from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And then John provides a doctrinal test. He says, by this you know the Spirit of God, that every spirit who confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. So the doctrine is the most important part. And understand that Satan can use false wonders in order to support his teaching. Um, Deuteronomy 13 is a passage that God spoke through Moses and warned his children that even if a prophet comes and his predictions come true, which, you know, maybe he got lucky, maybe there's a demonic power that's behind his predictions, if he is still teaching God's people to worship idols and commit wickedness, then all of his teachings should be ignored anyway. So false wonders can sometimes come along to support false teaching. So how do we resist this? And, and this is certainly the most important thing we'll talk about in this lesson. And it is the last slide that I'll share with you today. How do we resist Satan's efforts to trip us up by the means of false teaching? Well, number one is really obvious, isn't it? If we're going to do as 1 John 4 teaches us, and if we're going to test the spirits, then obviously we've got to know God's word really well. And so this very famous passage that we sometimes quote, Acts chapter 17, becomes a great watchword and a goal for every single Christian, not to get his or her religion from the lips of the preacher all the time, but to study on our own so that we will not be gullible or vulnerable to false teaching from pulpits or from charismatic people. Acts 17 and verse 11. It says that these, that is the Bereans, were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things were so. So they listened to this new teacher, Paul, coming to their town and explaining the prophecies of the Old Testament in light of the deeds of Jesus Christ. And they say, mm, that's that's interesting. Now, let us open the word of God ourselves and compare what you're saying to the things that God has written down. And then we can make a determination as to whether or not those things are true. And that's what we've got to do every single time we hear a preacher get up and preach. It doesn't matter how respectable he is, how long he's been with us, how smooth his delivery is. Those, those things are all great. But what's really important is the words that he is speaking. And do they match with what we find in God's word? And in order to make that comparison, to make that judgment, then we have to be people who know God's word on our own. So study. If you have a good understanding of God's word, that makes it very, very difficult for Satan to trip you up by means of false teaching. 
that, that don't just leave that to the work of preachers and elders. Um, preachers are supposed to study a lot, obviously. Elders, too, are supposed to have a knowledge of God's Word that allows them to contradict false teachers that stand in their pulpits and congregations. But ultimately, that has to come down to each and every one of us individually studying Scripture. And also, be very, very savvy when it comes to the interpretation of Scripture. There are different tricks that people can play in order to match a false teaching to a Scripture. In fact, I've heard it said that if you quote Scripture selectively enough, if you rip it out of context carefully enough, that you can prove almost anything by quoting a passage of Scripture. So beware of what is sometimes called proof texting, of, of simply stating a doctrine and then quoting one or two passages to go along with it and then you know, dusting off your hands, there it is, that's a biblical doctrine. I would suggest that that's exactly what Satan himself does back in the passage that we started with in Matthew chapter 4. Go back to that and, and look at it once again. What's happening here is that the tempter comes and tempts Jesus with hunger and invites him to make these stones become bread, which, by the way, the, this goes to another subject, but um, Jesus has performed miracles many times in Scripture. In fact, there's one very similar to this, right, where he feeds the 5,000 by making bread. Why is it wrong here? And I think that this strikes to his nature as the incarnate son of God, that his purpose in coming was to live as a human being and to not, in a manner of speaking, cheat or take a shortcut. He has got to live as a person and trust by faith the will of God, just as any of us do also. Uh, if he just calls upon uh, his miraculous powers at will to get himself out of every scrape, well, that's not living like a human being does. So um, I think that's why this would have been a sinful thing for Jesus to do, or let's just say a wrong thing for Jesus to do. And that's why Satan tried to ruin his ministry by making that suggestion. Jesus responds by quoting scripture, and that's as we all should do. But then when you get to the second temptation in verses five through seven, again, we're in Matthew chapter four, um, you'll notice that Satan sort of says, well, two can play this game. If Jesus quotes scripture, then Satan says, I can quote, quote scripture too. And in verse six, he says, for it is written, and he quotes from Psalm 91. But notice Jesus' response in verse seven. Jesus said to Satan, on the other hand, it is written. And so that, that's a really important um, four words right there, on the other hand. If somebody has a doctrine and, and even quotes scripture, but the way they're using that scripture flies in the face of the plain meaning of a different passage of scripture, then there's probably something wrong with it, with the interpretation that is. Um, something has to give, right? Because God is the one who has inspired all scripture. And, and we take it as an article of faith that that scripture is not going to contradict there may be certain ambiguities. There may be certain statements that are more or less true in different situations, like uh, life is complicated or life is simple. But a, a true contradiction just cannot be. So if one scripture is quoted in such a way that contradicts another scripture, something's wrong with our interpretation, and we need to look at it again. And that's exactly what Jesus does here. We have to use scripture correctly. Satan quotes scripture, but he's using it incorrectly to draw a wrong conclusion. And Jesus calls him out on that by demonstrating that a different passage of scripture uh, actually brings us to the correct interpretation. And then finally, watch out for the other signs of the, of the false teacher. I, again, ultimately, it comes down to the words being spoken. But these things are also important. They, they just at least give us a clue or throw up a red flag that something is not as it should be and that we should perhaps investigate that teacher's doctrine a little bit more closely. For example, Matthew chapter 7 and verses 15 through 20 talks about beware of the false prophets 
who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Remember, Satan is our enemy. He seeks to destroy us, and he's using these false prophets to do it. But then in verse 16, Jesus says, you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. So if a, a teacher is involved in hypocrisy, or if the outcome of his teaching is wickedness or hypocrisy, that throws up a red flag and, and lets us know that his teaching probably doesn't ma match scripture. Now, there's some exceptions to this rule. I, I think we all have known some excellent, truthful preachers who have gotten caught up in a season of sin, and, and we've got to deal with that on its own as well. But one of the signs of a teacher who is actually at the beck and call of Satan is that his life is full of wickedness and bad things. We've got to be very, very careful about his teaching if we see the outcome of his teachings is, is wrong or the outcome of his own life doesn't match his calling. Another one is in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. Nor, we already talked about that, right? But look at the next one. Nor the one who does not love his brother. Love is an actual excellent sign that somebody has your best interests in mind and that the preaching of the gospel is designed to bring others to salvation. If love is not part of his, um, of his preaching or of his efforts or, or of his life, that throws up a red flag as well. So our, our behavior and our attitude toward others is really important. And then the last one, this is Deuteronomy chapter 18. It takes us all the way back to Moses' pardon advice for the children of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 22. <clears throat> it says, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if that thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. So again, we looked at Deuteronomy 13 a little earlier and said, you know, there might actually be some false teachers whose predictions come true. And we still have to be careful if his teaching leads us into a path of wickedness or idolatry. But this is a red flag. This is a surefire sign right from the very beginning that if a prophet comes along and says, the world is going to end on June 30th, 2021, and that doesn't happen, then we can pretty well throw out every other thing that he has to say. And, and actually, there are some whole religious groups whose doctrine is based on false teaching. Um, predictions that have been made about the coming of Jesus that happened and it didn't happen, and they tried again and it still didn't happen. And you know, you got to draw the conclusion that the whole of their teaching is false. So watch out for false teaching and false prophecy when it comes to uh, judging the approach of a preacher. So in conclusion, Satan will use false teaching to separate us from God. We don't want to allow that to happen. So use some of this practical advice. Know God's word. Be a, a savvy student. Know when you're being taken advantage of and don't allow Satan to separate you from God through false teaching.